troubles by the score. Every day you love me less, each day I love you more. Yes, I've got heartaches by the number of love that I can't win. But the day that I stop counting, that's the day my world will end. Uh, well, usually I have to play a lot of builds of games that I'm working on, so uh, uh, just, just some things really quick. Uh, I wasn't uh, actually very involved with Tyranny. It was mostly uh, a lot of being drawn away for Pillar's work, uh, uh, and uh, but I was involved with Numenera and uh, Nice Old Republic, too, like like you were saying. So right now, uh, I've been playing a lot of the Divinity Original Sin 2 uh, work that they've been doing, which has been pretty fantastic. Uh, I really like the companion mechanics. Uh, I'm playing No Man's War, uh, sorry, uh, This War of Mine, uh, which I really like. Um, I think it's uh, it's kind of a really interesting survival platforming game. If you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. Uh, Darkest Dungeon, when I don't need to relax. And then uh, I've been having fun with a lot of the quests in Fallout Shelter. Yeah, so for New Reno, um, I actually didn't know that much about the location, so I just did a lot of research online, looked for a significant signpost, and then took the uh, very small, like, page-and-a-half design document that uh, Tim Kane, Leonard, and Jason had set up before they left Black Isle and tried to expand out from there. Like, okay, what would a mobster mentality be like? Like, what, what sort of things could a different Fallout character do that would be, you know, kind of cool in a city of sin? And then I just built out from there. Um, for more recent Fallout work, uh, like for the New Vegas DLCs, it would usually depend on which DLC it was because we tried to give each one a very different feel. Uh, for Dead Money, uh, we dug into the Sierra Madre, uh, like uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre movie very deeply. That was part of the homework assignments for the team members. Uh, for Old World Blues, uh, we basically dissected every 1950s crazy sci-fi film we could and looked for specific snapshots and underground lab locations. And then uh, for Lonesome Road, a lot of the inspiration for that came from uh, Mark Millar's Old Man Logan, which tells what Wolverine's life would have been like in a post-apocalyptic Marvel universe, which is awesome. And then also Damnation Alley by Roger Zelazny. Yeah, that was a difficult balance to strike because we were trying, obviously there was the 1950s kind of wacky, you know, uh, comedy elements about it. But at the same time, we still had to present them as a threat to the player. So actually, uh, Dr. Klein, who's the head of the think tank, he was the one where we sort of had to do a borderline. He's a very jealous, envious professor <laughs> type but he still had to have enough authority where you were like well because he's running the show here if i do cross him it's actually going to go pretty badly so striking that line between haha -ha humor and then there's actually a real threat here was a was something that we had to be careful of when doing um doing their design and also that opening sequence just went on way too long which is a i don't know a writing error that we can get to later if we get to that question <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, I will say that that was not the chosen length. Uh, we uh, one writing error that, I, and I wish I'd fought more for this. Is, so first off, no no game should start with like a ten minute dialogue sequence, even if it's interactive. Like you want to get playing. The other thing is a lot of the uh, the over explanation and the over exposition was actually mandated, and uh, that was a bit frustrating because. I think at some point you have to trust the player to figure out what's going on and it's more interesting that way. So it wasn't it wasn't fully my choice, even though I'm I'm famous for very long dialogues. Yeah, it was really funny. A lot of the uh the, the push for that actually came from one of our uh, senior level designers, Jeff Huskus, who's kind of like an unspoken hero 
at the stand back at Black Isle. He uh, he's done a lot of great work. He was uh, so the the conversation unfortunately was already long, but then Jeff brought up well if I can influence it more, I think that would help out. So that's why you started seeing like barter options because the, the think tank doesn't understand the value of caps, for example. So then you can totally, <laughs> you can totally exploit that if you're clever enough. But there are a lot of the, uh, the sort of skill checks and that sequence, which I was already getting scared of. Uh, Je Jeff was a big help in sort of providing the push for that. So I, I, I just wanted to give him a shout out. So um, I'll keep this quick because I, I covered in other, other interviews. Really, just real quick. Uh, so I started pen and paper writing because uh, I had a bunch of modules I'd written for our our D and D group and gaming groups, and it felt like a waste to throw them away. So I figured, oh, why well, can't I submit them and try and uh, you know make a career out of this or see some more value out of it? And then they got accepted, and then uh, I used my connections there to get an interview at Interplay Entertainment, and then they hired me. Uh, but it really helped that I had something published. Because then they could point to it and go, hey, you know, someone was going to give that guy money for his work, and he's done a few a few of these works already. So that sort of gave me a, a leg up in the resume process, as well as getting a good recommendation from my editor. So the the two things I'd suggest are please, like, you know, get something published, get something out there, even if it's like a mod or just a small indie game, and uh, don't ignore the power of networking and always have a strong work ethic so that people have no fears about recommending you when they see an opportunity. Uh, well, two things really quick. Uh, so should, if, if anyone actually ever does want to, to refer to the previous uh, point, um, if anyone ever does have any sort of how they want to get in the gang industry advice, uh, my handle is just like Chris Avalone on Twitter. Just drop me a line, and uh, I'm happy to answer whatever questions people have or give you like the the long structured you know approach for how to how to get into gaming. So please don't feel free. I mean, feel free to to drop me a line, and you know, don't be scared to ask. Uh, in terms of genres um, that uh, I would like to work in or would be excited about, I got to be honest. I'm I'm, I'm already doing it. Um, I hadn't had a lot of exposure to sci-fi, for example, and to be able to do that is fantastic, uh, not just with Prey, but there's so many opportunities out there. Uh, also, I think one of your um, forum members, or, or maybe it was you, raised a really interesting RPG idea, which I hadn't thought of, which is sort of adventuring in the afterlife. And I'm like, wow, that could, that could be a pretty cool basis for a role-playing game. Well, I think there's a lot of hope now of the franchise that the, the White Wolf property has opened up, and I'm sure they're interested in exploring uh, ways of bringing those franchises to the computer gaming world. I, I was hoping that Troika would do a werewolf game after Bloodlines, because I, I, thought, I thought Bloodlines was great. Um, and I, to, see them, to, to see that same RPG aesthetic in a more brutal world uh, felt, I mean, felt pretty cool. I think that would have been a... A really, a really nice thing to see. I, and also, you know, there's also, um, I don't know if you ever read uh, Riverworld, but, you know, that's an example of a, of a franchise that I think you could make an RPG out of. And there's, I think there's just so many possibilities in that space that you could have a lot of fun with. Um, I love it. I think any time a product inspires someone to create or provide their own response, perspective or even fix a fault that happened in the core game I think is uh, is something that that's worthwhile for both uh, the, the the modders and for the developers because the developers see where they could have done more or they see a new idea or a new a new way to approach uh, you know scripting for AI for example and then uh, the players and the modders it just gives them inspiration to create their own material. Um, which I think is great on both sides. Like when we were doing uh, Old World Blues, like we, we did go through all the mods that were out there and tried to see what deficiencies there were in the core game. And it was pretty quickly apparent that we hadn't designed a home base that was good enough. And, uh, and so we saw about uh, trying to improve that experience. And um, 
Also, it's great when modders are able to resurrect stuff that you just didn't have time to put in the game, and then they just do a better job than you ever did, and then you're like, well, thank you guys. We should have just hired you in the first place. Um, one other success story was when we were doing um, Neverwinter Nights 2, uh, we got to the, um, the expansion packs. We actually went out and found the guy who'd done the, uh, I think the Neverwinter Nights 1 AI scripting, and we purposely brought him on board so that we could use his expertise to improve the fights and the encounters in Neverwinter 2, and I think that's a win for both sides. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, wow, that's a, so, uh, okay, the reason I'm pausing is because, so I go into Target, and I see a Fallout shirt that's being mass produced. So my first thought is, okay, well now Fallout and the iconography for Fallout is now entering mainstream culture. So yeah, I do think that there would be a market for a movie or a TV series. I do, I do think an HBO series would would be a great place to start personally. I, yeah, a movie, I feel like there's a lot about Fallout you'd have to cram into a short period of time when an HBO series, hopefully several seasons, uh, could could really give more richness to that world. Yeah, there was Jericho, and then there was the uh, Michael Straczynski Apocalypse uh, series, who I, unfortunately, my name, uh, the name is escaping me right now. Um, and I, I felt like the Straczynski one was an example of great writing, but they just didn't have the production push behind it to really make it happen. Jericho, I did like, and I thought the production values were very good. Uh, however, for some reason, I just lost interest halfway through season one. I think it's because I felt like they were being like too cryptic with stuff. And uh, I, I guess, and I, I've been guilty of this too, but sometimes when uh, a series is too cryptic, my first thought is the writers don't know what they're doing. Uh, might I interject um, this show you were talking about, uh, that was probably Jeremiah. That is correct, yes. I, you know what? In fact, I recently I watched, watched it and uh, it was actually really quite cool. Yeah, I really like a lot of the uh, the episode arcs that they had in uh, in, uh, in Jeremiah. Like, uh, and it's really weird. It was so close to the Jericho name too. I, maybe it's just something post apocalyptic about J E R. I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, Black Isle was. I'm kind of sad about this, but Black Isle was dying a very slow death it's mostly like you know you you felt like you were the only beating organ in a you know body that's slowly dying around you and also that was being felt in a lot of other design ways um like our last i felt like we hadn't really had a really good push with products since fallout um and Baldur's gate and it felt like all we were doing was taking Bioware's technology and their tool at their rule set and their tool sets and then building content but that content wasn't really pushing the envelope like the Icewind Dale series games just felt like let's desperately try and make money to keep ourselves afloat and we did try and do a Baldur's Gate 3 you know and, and build our own engine you know and that and that failed and then we we moved a number of those people onto Fallout Van Buren but you know by the time Baldur's Gate 3 was canceled and the reasons it was canceled which were never fully made clear to us beyond oh it's an accounting error which has nothing to do with how hard you're working on the project or how much how passionate people are about it it's 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 because someone else messed up and you're like okay well if that's how it's going to be and this could change on a dime um then chances of having future projects at Black Isle are not very likely and it, it's really rough like because with Van Buren I've worked on that for many years and I really love the stuff that we hope to do with it but I just didn't see any potential of that actually coming to light at, at Interplay especially with their with their growing console focus and the engine that was being developed for Van Buren just did not feel very console friendly so I think the executive row actually made the decision that they were going to cancel it well before 
like even a demo came out, but. Yeah, so um, yeah, Black Isle had a lot of struggles. And I'd probably point the, the biggest struggle was they never seemed to be able to develop their own technology and their own engine, which is really important because that makes you reliant on someone else. Like, and that can be good or, or bad because um, sometimes borrowing someone else's engine is, is absolutely the, the best and most efficient option for for us for whatever experience you want to make uh but black owl could never do it internally like so, so many so much resources were wasted on stone keep too uh like uh we, we we couldn't seem to like you know build an you know an engine fully for Baldur's gate 3 it, it still felt kind of like creaky and was still going to take a lot more time which you know is more resources and we didn't have the funds for that uh it's it's really weird like uh, the infinity engine basically kept black isle's heart beating for a long time but you know fallout 2's engine was kind of showing its age and they really couldn't do another game per se with that engine without taking i think a, a pretty big perception hit but i mean not not for me i don't care i just want more fallout but uh but yeah there was there was a whole bunch of just uh, organizational and uh, just uh, just managerial issues, and it, it it was it's sometimes hard to develop games in that environment. Uh, I actually thought it was great, especially for the uh, the the world building aspects, and then we were able to port over our, sort of our own dialogue editor, so we sort of had the best of both worlds. Um, so we so we had an editor editor that the writers were familiar with creating content for. And then uh, we had the very, very robust uh, technology that the, uh, the the terrain shaping allowed for, which was which was pretty cool. Um, so it, it, that wasn't that much of an issue. One issue that always that did seem to crop up was we weren't sure. I felt like uh, a number of system changes were occurring that caused changes changes in the existing editors. And sometimes it seemed like there was a lot of effort being placed on that that could be better directed elsewhere versus, you know what, let's just create a fun fallout experience uh, and just create a really cool wasteland for you to explore versus sort of tearing apart the editors and the systems and things like that. Yeah, actually, uh, there's a few spots. Uh, one is um, I always thought uh, one of our one of our designers before he left Obsidian and went to Blizzard, he he brought up the idea that doing a Fallout New Orleans would be very cool. And immediately uh, that you know that strikes sort of a little bell in your head because you know uh, New Orleans has that that ambience and mystique about it, which sort of mimics like the signature cities like Vegas and. And DC, so that would be cool. Uh, I do know that Fallout Tactics was planning to go to that area for the sequel, and also parts of Florida. But uh, for me, New Orleans seemed like a pretty cool place. Um, I also feel like Texas is kind of begging for it, but uh, I think there was a the mod uh, Fallout Lone Star that was going to explore that section. Uh, but for right now, I guess I just got fixed it on on New Orleans. I don't really know why. You know, still doing role playing games and game writing for as long as uh, <laughs> as, as long as my life holds out. I, I think that's all I ever wanted to do. Um, do you mean uh, just an just an RPG and a franchise and a system that you would create on your own, or a, or an RPG based on an existing franchise? Well, um, okay, that's a good question. So I guess one thing that I always liked about the fallouts was I never felt like they forced you to choose a class. And this might be that, you know, I have strong like hero games, pen and paper roots, where you could basically just get, you know, 100, 150 points, and then you build a character that was the character that you wanted to play. And if that's a fighter, great. If that's a thief, great. 
But if you want to blend it or have some fun or, you know, you can do that with 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 the fact that you you have more control over your skill set and where your points go. And that's what I liked about Fallout, where they presented you with a series of skills and a series of attributes. And they're like, go ahead and define who you think you are in this world and just make sure that all those skills and abilities actually do have equal weight in the environment. Like Fallout has that challenge where if you're if you have the high charisma and speech, of course, you have to include the path for talking characters. But sometimes game masters will miss that and in favor of just raw combat. So if I had any advice, I, I, I do think uh, classless systems are the, are the way to go. Um, I feel that um, having a wide range of skills allows people to sort of uh, give even more personality to their characters without realizing it. Um, I, I learned that all the way back on SSI's Eternal Dagger, where I, I felt like I started with a bunch of blank slates. But then because they provided so many skills for me to upgrade, each of my characters started having personalities based on their stats, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, uh, and beyond that, uh, just do a lot of play testing, a lot of focus testing, and uh, take that feedback to heart. Yeah, uh, almost all the companion dialogues in Torment uh, almost didn't make it, um, mostly because uh, they didn't want to localize any more of the game. Um, so I kind of just went ahead and did it anyway, and I'm like, look, if only the English folks see this, I'm sure someone else will translate this eventually. Uh, it was not it was not a smart move. Uh, in fact, my, my boss told me it was a career-limiting move, uh, which was his polite way of saying that you know, it, that that puts a bullseye on my head for getting fired, uh, which is I which I got. But I I really wanted to make sure you had a chance to explore like your companions' backstories more uh, with the individual dialogue. So I'm happy I did that. Um, but that was a very late game addition to Planescape Torment. But I think the the game would have been missing a lot of its heart without it. Yeah, I agree, and and you know the, and the interesting thing is you, you can do very little um, to 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 actually give them personalities like that. You can do things like you know just simple rewriting of voice sparks, which isn't you know in a, a large number of lines for how they react in combat. Uh, even their combat AI can give them personalities for whether they support you or don't, uh, and. Uh, you might, if you ever get a chance to talk to uh, the original Fallout One guys, you know, with uh, especially Tim Kane, you, I think the the companions in Fallout One ended up being an accident, where they're like, "Oh, we can't do this, so why don't we put some companions in?" And then we were able to leverage uh, that that uh, <laughs> that gain into Fallout Two and sort of expand their personalities even more, but. Uh, the, the, it was really interesting to me that Fallout 1 never had intended to have companions at the start, but then it just kind of evolved that way once this, one, I think one of the scripters, uh, Jesse Heinig, figured out a way to do it, and then it just made the game a lot cooler, especially with dog meat. Uh, I felt really bad for uh, Dacon and Planescape Torment. Um, I felt like uh, the, there, there's a sequence where you, you get to see uh, how you first met him. And uh, that sequence uh, still makes me sad for how manipulative uh, it is and how, how bad you feel for him as a victim. Um, because uh, I mean, when I when it comes to describing the lowest point in someone's life, that's pretty much it. And then to 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 use that as leverage in a very cruel way is just kind of adds insult to injury. So that that's probably one that I'd point to. Well, um, to to just to give you a direction for that, actually, um, that situation isn't a place in the game. It's what happens when you when you do a lot of digging into his dialogue and his ethics and uh, the religion that he follows. And once you fully understand these concepts that are guiding him, at that point, you can start remembering things. And that's what takes you back to that um, that very sad moment.
Yeah, I, I played it when it first came out, and then uh, I played it again before working on Wasteland 2. And while there wasn't a lot that influenced uh, Fallout 2, except possibly some toaster references in the EPA and a few other design User hooks there, channel, recording. Are, in my opinion, pretty minor, but they, they, were, they were Wasteland influenced. Um, the big influence came with uh, with Old World Blues. Like a, you, you can see a lot of the homage elements in terms of uh, types of weapons you can use, and also the the whole presence of the the robot scorpions, for example, was very much a tip of the hat to Wasteland. Uh, those games actually made me see exploration in a different way. Like, it's one thing to walk across the map in Fallout 2 or even walk across a map in an isometric game, but when suddenly you have full camera range to see, like, events on the horizon, for example, and then use those as hooks to lure the player in or even as, like, compass points to sort of reference where you are in the wasteland. Like, that changes your level design aesthetic uh, quite a bit, and it also makes it much easier for introducing quest seeds like and this is a bad example but like you see smoke on the horizon or uh you see someone flashing like morse code signal from on top of a you know a tower in the distance but those are things that you can choose to engage in that are much more difficult to do if you didn't have that camera available to you and i'll, I'll be honest like i feel that the more freedom you give a player with interface uh, including customizing that interface and camera control, that makes the entire experience more freeing. So I, I, I'm I'm pretty much in favor of that. It doesn't work for every game, but I I think that with with Fallout, it actually it, work, it works pretty well. Um, that is a good question. So I. I, I have worked on one of those and, and I did enjoy it. It was it, it was another um, opportunity to so so a lot of a lot of my current direction is I've been writing for menu driven dialogue systems for a very, very long time to the point where it feels kind of stale. Um, so part of my goals over the next few years is I just want to try and like write for every genre and try and see what I can learn from it, whether it's like, you know, whether it's rogue style or VR or, 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 or walking simulators and, uh, walking simulators are really interesting in the sense that, um, it's, it's very important the world visually tell a story, but sometimes that feels like it you know like it can't be enough like like in firewatch uh firewatch i think does a, does a great job of blending the the sense of sort of uh characters in the environment with your exploration of that environment sort of your exploration of self and i think finding that really good balance is is important um i also like the fact that they tend to be they tend to feel like short stories to me which and i, I like short stories just because i feel like they get to the theme quicker and they get to the point faster and, the, and they also get to it cleaner than a, than a long sort of what I would describe as a messier 60 to 100 or 200 or 400 hour experience. Like a walking simulator generally tells a very focused story while still giving you freedom within that, within that, that territory you're exploring. Yeah, and I know that, uh, you know, VR may be something that gives, you know, some listeners an allergic reaction, but, uh, you know, the Firewatch, you know, if, if the Firewatch or walking simulator experience in VR, uh, I, I think is a lot, is a lot more powerful than people realize if they haven't tried it. It's the immersion level just goes up so, so much. And if they can figure out uh, how to solve a lot of the walking mechanics issues, I think that that's going to be a really powerful uh, game experience in, in years to come. So whenever I get asked the, the dividing line for an RPG, um, I usually point to System Shock 2. And I'm like, there is one reason, in my opinion, that System Shock 2 
is not an RPG, even though it seems to have every other element about it. And the, the element that it's missing is that I don't really have much of a choice about what's going on. I never really make a decision in that game other than shooting and advancing forward. Now, if there was a point where I could make some sort of decision, no matter how minor, then I think it would have been an RPG. But because it was much more of a, here's what the plot line's eventually going to be, and you have different ways to reach there, uh, like action-wise, but you don't really interact with anyone in that game at all. And that's, I think that's kind of what makes an RPG. There needs to be some element of player agency where you can sort of step back and go, based on the personality of my character, I would choose this option with this person or how to solve this quest or this encounter that isn't slowly, that isn't just blowing it up, for example. And that's, I think, the key aspect. You need to be able to uh, make your, your gameplay personality felt in some fashion and see a significant result as, a ba as based on that, because that's what role playing is about. Like you, you're taking on a role and you want that role to have an impact in the environment. Yeah, and, and and don't get me wrong, like I, I love System Shock. I still point to it to this day for design examples and uh, how to implement certain features that, that still confuse me why they're not being done to this day. Uh, I mean, because exploration wise, the, the ability to choose your class, the fact that classes felt very different yet useful, uh, the character generation backstory I thought was awesome. It reminded me a lot of Traveler. Uh, the open world level design, the voice acting, even the voice acting even for the cannon fodder was horrifying. And uh, it was just so well executed that I, you know, I, I applaud them to this day. thing I do have to say is I, I feel like uh, remake's probably not the best word. I, I would probably define it as a reboot and I'm sure the team would do too because I the elements that I'm seeing it's it's not going to be solely a one for one recreation of the original one there's a there's a lot more that I think is uh is being introduced into the the reboot that I think makes it qualify as a reboot and it's something that's really fascinating and it's just stuff that we might take for granted nowadays but wasn't available back in the time when System Shock 1 was being developed. But now there's all sorts of opportunities for leveraging that technology to sort of emphasize a lot of the stuff that they were doing in System Shock 1. So I think I'm, I'm kind of excited about that. They had so many cool stuff in System Shock 1. I am amazed, like the, uh, the ability to reclaim the heal chambers uh, which which sounds well that's pretty basic but, but it that was a cool feature uh, I could see that being used for a lot of puzzles for example the sheer amount of uh, cool technology elements you could grab whether it was the skates or dealing with invisible monsters like all that stuff I'm just like wow and 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 then they even had the difficulty mode so even if you didn't want to deal with all the combat they basically had a story mode in there that just made it super easy to get to the game and uh, no, there's just so much cool stuff they put in there. I'm, I'm amazed that they were able to get it all in. Uh, that's a good question. Um, did, did you guys feel that the transition from uh, Fallout 2 to Fallout 3, did you, did, it, it, did you guys find that very jarring? I'm, I'm going to suspect yes, but I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts. Sure, I'll, I'll I'll indulge. The when I saw uh, Fallout Three, which was ironically what I started off with before going to uh, Fallout Two One and then uh, New Vegas, I remember seeing a lot of trailers about uh, and and I believe I got involved in the Let's Play of Fallout One and Two, and I was very interested in uh, the game. I always thought, I, and even though Fallout Three with its modern technology, I always liked uh, Fallout One and Two's gameplay a lot better. Strangely. Um, but one of the things that was really confusing to me is how they shifted dramatically in uh, prioritizing role-playing elements 
um, to exploration and just, you know, just shooting and looting, which is to me what Fallout 3 really felt like. I felt like there was abandonment of, uh, of, of game principles that were used in Fallout 1 and 2. Um, like, there didn't really feel like the skills or the uh, perks that you, you chose. Um, because one of the perks, one of my favorite perks in uh, Fallout New Vegas was uh, confirmed bachelor in, in Cherm Lim Cafes or something, which was really interesting because not only did it have like a small gameplay uh, impact, but it also impacted uh, your dialogue responses and, and whatnot. Um, and I felt like also that the your uh, special system, the way you specialized in it, uh, was pretty uh, was pretty uniquely differently handled in Fallout 2 compared to Fallout uh, 3 because you can be able to become a really charming and uh, intelligent person but also be uh, physically weak and it can show up in the game. And uh, Fallout New Vegas did an excellent job at displaying uh, a lot of the different kind of builds that players could go. Um, and besides, I thought that the uh, NPCs uh, and that the factions that were used in Fallout 3 weren't really that interesting and I felt like they should have gone for something new and I'm glad in New Vegas, while you did have some uh, elements like the Enclave rem Remnants, right? It, that's what it should have been. And it was a very uh, touching and uh, interesting experience. That's what I kind of felt like my Fallout 3 and Fallout 2 experience was. Yeah, um, I kind of started with the same thing. Like I got I played Fallout 3 first and then I sort of played Fallout 1 a few years later. And but at that, that time I was still quite young, so I kind of started off with it and just need, need, needless to say I didn't get far. But for me, going back and playing Fallout Two and then playing Fallout Three again, it, I can sort of sense that while I still enjoy Fallout Three, it kind of lost something in between the transition between Fallout Two and Three. And I think New Vegas sort of brought something back over again. Um, I think I like the sort of atmosphere in Fallout Three. Um, as it kind of reminds me of Fallout 1, like the two of them have very similar atmosphere in my opinion. They're just how I sort of play it. And I sort of feel New Vegas again brought back some of that atmosphere in some places, especially I think it was Vault 11, the one with the um, the suicide vault, I think it was. That was quite a quite a neat little vault, really. And, um, uh, really and, um, if I could break in, that is probably one of the best visual storytelling areas, I think, that, and, and New Vegas gets a lot of compliments about it. That's, that's like a perfect example of what you can tell with props. Oh, yeah, like every time I just talk about Fallout, I just mention that one vault as saying you should just play it just for that one place alone. Of course, the story is also really good as well. But, um, but for me, Fallout 3 kind of gave a lot more exploration to the series it sort of there was something there in the third and first person which couldn't be done in the isometric sort of play and um, play and um, games as well but i think with isometric you sort of had the sort of sense that the world was much bigger there was a lot more communication between the settlements in fallout 1 and 2 than in fallout 3 and i think in general i kind of preferred how I can sort of have different play styles in Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas, as opposed to 3, which is, again, just sort of, sort of shoot and loot, but it wasn't quite to the extent that Fallout 4 was. Well, um, to me, uh, this transition was uh, not that jarring because, well, uh, I was always been, I've always been a big fan of um, the Elder Scrolls games, so basically it uh, felt kind of uh, right for me but um well not exactly for uh for fallout i mean i was expecting a bit of a different game uh in that regard but um yeah uh, i mean this uh as was mentioned before this whole shift uh, to a more explore exploratory style of gameplay um uh, that was definitely uh took some time to to get used to and also um i didn't really like uh, the the later, later uh, Elder Scrolls games uh, like Oblivion uh, with uh, the handling like with uh, all the quest markers and uh, this more uh, this more streamlined um, uh, type of gameplay there. So, uh, but yeah, in, in general, it was a relatively smooth transition at least for me. Well, I first started with Fallout Three, like a lot of people, and so. First, the other game I played after that was New Vegas, and uh, it was 
it was it felt it felt more I'm sorry, it's hard for me to put it in words, but it just felt like it more impactful with me than Fallout Three. It was like I felt like more my choices my more of my choices mattered. There's more interaction with the environment and sorry, I I'm having a hard time thinking about this right now. felt the world felt more it just, it felt more believable it i i was very appreciative of all the of the dialogue and the interactions with different characters in the world it felt more impactful uh just yeah. really quick uh, what you said yeah. about what, what you said about stalker there really quick but the uh uh just so you know i think uh, the stalker's uh, interface mechanics actually had a big influence on the uh the hardcore interface mechanics and organization for New Vegas, but just as a sideline there. Yeah, how am I sounding? Okay, so in my opinion. Uh oh. He is. He must have a low luck score. <laughs> Like that Google Hangout incident where Google hated me for no reason. Google Hangouts is a very touchy system. I, if I could ever default to, to, to Skype, for me, Skype generally carries the day. But Google Hangouts just never seems to work that, that first time, and it wastes so much time trying to get it. Or, uh, anyway, it's not just to you, man. That, that thing, I think it's out for me. I have to I have to warn you, uh, just to sound a five minute warning, and then I have to go off to uh, my uh, my system shock reboot meeting. But I just want to give you a heads up. Oh, that is very kind. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will start by saying that originally I started with Fallout New Vegas, so I, I didn't start from the beginning, but going from Fallout New Vegas to Fallout 1 and 2, I didn't exactly get to play uh, Fallout 3, but I have done a lot of research and uh, looked up a lot about what it's about. I've you know seen some videos, and to be honest, going from Fallout 1 and 2 to Fallout 3, I think I would have to agree with that. To be honest, the third Fallout game feels more like a like a theme ride, like a uh, I don't know, like a big theme park. It just it doesn't seem to have much continuity. And while they did give some, you know, give some callbacks to some of the people from the previous games, I, I don't know. I, it was a giant change, and I don't really think it was for the better. But considering that Fallout New Vegas was able to uh, bring back uh, some of what, uh, actually a lot of what, uh, Fallout 1 and 2 did, even if it wasn't isometric, I think if they would have went along with that, I don't think it would have been nearly as as different, uh, jarring, even though it had, its other, it had some other problems, but that's about it for me. Yeah, I'd go back and uh, fix the layout for Lonesome Road. Uh, I think there was a huge error 
in the design direction for that DLC and that providing a linear experience is not something that any Fallout fan wants. Yeah, but there were other ways to structure it. Um, one of the other uh, design ideas, which uh, we, we didn't go with, was that uh, Ulysses would present you with, uh, with backstories about the communities that used to live in that area um, and then set up a context for what was lost at the end. But that was, that was intended to be a much more of an open world environment where like, you could go to five or six different places to learn about what had come before, as well as seeing what it was now, and then use that to inform your decision at the end, and also use that as an additional convincing tool for why why he's so very wrong, because he, he is incredibly wrong. But that, that was one direction, and I really wish we'd gone with that, to be honest. Well, uh, actually, me and uh, 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 Sven uh, Venke from Larian Studios were actually having this discussion. Uh, it, once you've gone through the process like two or three times and you've made a lot of mistakes, and <laughs> uh, we both have, you sort of form this really weird mental checklist of approaches for how you tackle characters or quests that you don't necessarily even write down anymore. It's just a, it's just a pattern that you follow. Um, some, uh, some things that have aided me with quest with, with uh, character design in the past is uh, there was this uh, series of supplements called central casting that will I like sort of randomly roll up like backgrounds for characters. And, and that was fun. I also keep an idea file uh, on quests and spells and locations and characters and quests that you, uh, on my computer that I usually just like, you know, do digital notes from for my Kindle or, you know, when I'm watching a movie or a TV series, I'll take a screenshot of a location or a piece of dialogue and then use that as sort of like a big idea folder that I'll sort through uh, if I have writer's block, which doesn't seem to be happening much nowadays. So I feel really bad that I'm still collecting all that stuff. Um, and then uh, the, the best way to, I've always found to start is when you're doing a character request, uh, you examine all the systems in the game how that quest or character can help support it or inform it from a narrative perspective. Also, how the player can influence it through the systems they have at their disposal. Like, like Fallout, for example, has you know, the speech, combat, stealth, but also evil and good and what faction type you are. All those can come into play. Just make sure you're considering them each one at a time when dealing with an NPC or quest. And usually a lot of the game world, the game logic will help inform you about how those situations should turn out. And that's a lot of fun. And and if it turns out that you know uh, you have more than one idea for a quest or character, the nice thing about designing for RPG is you can explore all those branches and go, well, there's three ways I think would be cool. Why don't I just do all three of them? And then that ends up a lot more freedom than say when you're doing like a graphic novel or if you're doing like a short story or prose. And that's kind of one of the advantages that I think games has. But Blah, 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 blah. Actually, um, uh, I was actually, I wanted to ask about um, a specific uh, pen and paper system that you were using in your uh, playtest uh, sessions uh, back then. I think I read some interview at some point. Yeah, uh, just really quick and maybe I'll just uh, leave it there. So we actually took the system we were going to use for uh, Van Buren and made that pen and paper. And oh, because, yeah. it was, because it was designed to be turn-based, it all worked. So everyone just took their okay, turns okay. and ran through the quest and all the skills were there. And we tried out the new traits and the new perks. And we had a whole range of players from role players to the more like mini max guys that would let me know when certain systems were broken and then suggest fixes for it. Like, uh, and, that, and that, that was really valuable. So we had like about, I think, 12 players at, the, at a tight and each one had a different character they'd built with a different specialty. And that informed all the area designs and quest locations and, and really helped sort of like kick around those systems before we actually digitally implemented those. All right, really cool. So a lot of uh, percentile dice rolls and uh, yeah. Well, hey, thank you uh, for inviting me. And I realized there was a bunch of questions uh, we weren't able to get to. So if you want to do another one in the future, I'm happy to make the time. I know that I, 
I, I <laughs> this one took a little while to set up, but I, again, like I'm happy to do one in the future. I, I'm sure I, I'd be happy to, to carve out some more space if you guys wanted to ask any more questions. Just let me know. Oh, no, no, no worries at all. We, we are all busy. I think that just happens as life goes on. <laughs> And you guys have a good day as well. And again, thanks for thanks Thank for inviting me to talk. Thank you. Number three was when you called me and said that you were coming back to stay. With hopeful heart, I waited for you. Knock on the door. I waited, but you must have lost your.